Most people probably aren't familiar with Boa Ahmed Tanubu, who just a few months ago was shaking the hand of Bill Gates. Here at Plain Sight, we weren't until last year, when an obscure case eclipsed interest in Elon Musk, rising to the top of the list of most frequently viewed cases on Plain Sight. This was surprising, because according to Google, Elon Musk often gets more search interest than just about anything, even the Honda Civic, which reliably outpaces interest in popular sports teams such as the Boston Red Sox, and Joe Biden, the President of the United States. Tanubu's sudden rise to the level of America's tech elite was quite remarkable. The caption for that obscure case was USA versus account 263-226-700 et al., a not particularly helpful description of what it was about. In Latin, et al. means and others, so the case is essentially the United States versus a group of numbered bank accounts. Generally, when the United States sues an inanimate object, the dispute is a civil forfeiture action, meaning that the government took possession of someone's stuff, whether it's cash or whiskey or 50,000 cardboard boxes. A quick glance at the docket showed that many of the defendant bank accounts were held by someone named Bola Tanubu, and there were no documents accessible on PACER, the federal court database where you'd normally expect to find them, or even Court Listener, which, like Plain Sight, makes some PACER documents freely available. Having declared victory in a controversial February 2023 election, Bola Tanubu is now widely recognized as the president of Nigeria. But when USA vs. Account 263-226-700 et al. became the most viewed case on Plain Sight, Tanubu was merely a presidential candidate running against several others. The fact that he had been governor of Lagos State didn't hurt his chances. Neither did the fact that practically no one knew about his history with the United States justice system. In a way, this wasn't too surprising. The commercial internet didn't even exist until 1995, and Pacer didn't start reliably cataloging the proceedings of the federal courts until about 10 years after that. When you find a case involving docket entries from before 2005, it's a safe bet that you'll have to ask someone to dig paper files out of a box somewhere, usually for a fee, if that box can still be located. Fortunately, a Nigerian media outlet called Sahara Reporters had already gotten their hands on paper copies of these documents, which were posted on their website as one big Adobe Acrobat PDF file. Unfortunately, the document looked like it had been scanned with whatever the equivalent of an Atari 2600 would be for scanners. The words were barely legible, and the whole thing looked like maybe someone had manufactured it in Photoshop. So even though the file had been out there for years on a Nigerian website, there was understandably skepticism in the Nigerian online community that the documents were even real. But these documents were real. We separated out each one from the Sahara reporter's post and matched it to the proper slot on the 1993 Plain Sight docket, a basic task that no other website had ever done with respect to this particular case, which ended up making a difference, because people started to notice. With the documents in their proper locations on Plain Sight, it was a bit easier to figure out what the case was actually about. There was a great amount of detail in an affidavit written by Internal Revenue Service Special Agent Kevin Moss, which laid out the majority of the story. The United States had filed a civil forfeiture action, not against Tanubu himself, but against his money, hidden away in bank accounts in Chicago, Fairfax, Virginia, and London. These accounts were opened in Tanubu's own name, his wife's name, and in the name of a company, or maybe two companies, with a presence in both Nigeria and Washington, D.C. Compass Finance and Investment Company Limited in Nigeria, and Compass Investments Company Limited in Washington, D.C. Tanubu was accused in the IRS affidavit of laundering money for a Chicago heroin distribution ring that sourced much of its product from Nigeria, thanks to a man named Muiz Adegboyega Akande. Akande imported drugs from Nigeria with the help of his nephew, Abiodun Abele. Using his training as an accountant, Tanubu handled the cash. Based on the IRS affidavit filed by the United States Department of Justice in open court, Tanubu had committed at least six federal crimes. He ultimately settled the case with the United States government, which took $460,000 of his money and sent it to the Federal Reserve Bank for destruction. The rest, it seems, about $1 million, he got to keep. Meanwhile, those on the front line selling drugs in Gary, Indiana, including Edwards and his crew, went to prison. After reading the grainy pages over a few times, there was one question that nagged. Why wasn't Tanubu criminally charged? For someone who had lied to federal law enforcement, failed to file a tax return, conspired to launder money, actually laundered money, defrauded multiple banks, and used funds from unlawful activity, it seemed like he got off pretty light. There were other questions as well. Why were civil forfeiture case materials not available on PACER like every other federal civil lawsuit? Could the intelligence community have something to do with the state of affairs? And could this guy really become Nigeria's president? Well, as it turned out, he could, and in short order, he did. 
The traffic to Plain Sight was coming from social media discussion of a publication called West Africa Weekly, which had written up a fantastic expose of Tanubu and his involvement with narco-trafficking. To build on the IRS affidavit, already an excellent and comprehensive source of information about Tanubu's criminal activities, and the investigation by David Hundeyin in West Africa Weekly, we decided to file some Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, requests about Tanubu and his associates in the heroin trade that might help fill in some of the gaps in the story. At this point, I should clarify exactly what the word we means. Plain sight is the result of a lot of different people's contributions, but I took a personal interest in this matter because it seemed like a case where access to records in the United States justice system was just as important as the substance of the records themselves. I'm Aaron Greedspan, and I created Plain Sight in 2011. So, over a period of a few months in 2022 and early 2023, I filed nine FOIA requests with six federal agencies, the Executive Office for United States Attorneys, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, the State Department, and the Central Intelligence Agency. It took a while, but eventually, all of them were denied or ignored. One of the FBI responses politely informed me that it might be able to start producing documents in the year 2026. I appealed the denials and delay tactics. For its part, the CIA claimed that it simply forgot about the request and later sent a letter apologizing, which it later refused to acknowledge it had sent. The appeals were also unsurprisingly denied, on the grounds that Tanubu and Akande were entitled to personal privacy under the FOIA statute's off-cited Exemptions 6 and 7C. That presented the opportunity to sue, which given the stakes seemed like it might be worthwhile, especially after Tanubu won the election in February 2023. So I filed a FOIA lawsuit. The initial complaint was lodged on June 12, 2023. Later on, it was amended after the CIA issued its apology to include the CIA as a defendant. Much to my surprise, after the lawsuit was filed, some of the United States government agencies had a change of heart and by September agreed to start actually producing documents. There was a catch, however. They would neither confirm nor deny that the documents had anything to do with Bola Tanubu, only the Edwards drug ring in Indiana. This is where things get a bit complicated. The refusal to confirm or deny records is referred to as a Glomar response, in honor of a once-secret ship called the Glomar Explorer that was constructed to salvage the wreckage of a Soviet submarine off the ocean floor in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Since the CIA didn't want to admit that the Glomar Explorer even existed, it responded to a FOIA request by saying that it could neither confirm or deny anything about it. Now, the FBI, CIA, DEA, and State Department were giving Tanubu the Soviet submarine treatment while the IRS and EOUSA simply claimed that they couldn't find records. Things were getting more complicated, but as it turns out, everything with Bola Tanubu is kind of complicated. As David Hundeyin pointed out in his article, is Bola Tanubu even his real name? There are reasons to believe that the answer is probably not. Does it matter at this point? Not really. But while we were puzzling over the government's refusal to admit what it had already clearly admitted in 1993, that documents exist about Tanubu, there were other more recent controversies that proved to be massive distractions. It's incontrovertible that Tanubu lied when he told a Nigerian court under oath that he had attended the University of Chicago. He didn't. But he did go to school in the Chicago area, at Southwest College, now Richard J. Daly College, before he transferred to Chicago State University to study accounting. A letter floating around on the internet from the FBI dated July 28, 2011, suggests that Bola Tanubo, with an O, never attended Chicago State University per its registrar. If authentic, this letter doesn't say much about the I part of the FBI. At this point, his academic records have surfaced from both institutions, and there is even a federal court case concerning the diploma he submitted to Nigeria's election commission, which was, for whatever reason, fake. But even despite the fake diploma, which one of his staff members probably generated on a diploma mill website to avoid the embarrassment of having lost the original, Tanubu did graduate from Chicago State University. The confusion doesn't stop there, however. One of Tanubu's records from the Southwest College Registrar's Office states that Tanubu's gender is F for female. Is this a one-letter typo, or a sign that he stole the identity of a woman named Bola Tanubu? It's most likely just an error on the part of an American working in the Southwest College Registrar's Office in 1976 who is unfamiliar with Nigerian names and perhaps assumed that a first name ending the letter A belonged to a female. Tanubu appears in the Chicago State University yearbook not long after, looking very much like an M. But even this is not without some confounding factor, because he is listed in the 1980 yearbook. There was no yearbook in 1979 when he graduated. And he is listed under the wrong name, as are many students whose names have ridiculous typos, as Boa A. Thub. 
Also listed on the same page as Tanubu is Larmar Townsend, whose first name is almost certainly Lamar, not to mention Yuet and Yuan Trims, whose first names are almost certainly Yvonne and Yvette. Apparently, proofreading was not taught at Chicago State University in 1979 or 1980. So, going back to the main question, why wouldn't the United States government simply state the obvious, which is that it's sitting on a trove of documents about Nigeria's president from his days laundering money? Before we could get a straight answer, on October 18, 2023, I received a strange notification. A Washington, D.C. lawyer named Brian Carey had filed an appearance on my behalf in the lawsuit, and he was sponsoring another lawyer named Christopher W. Carmichael from outside of the District of Columbia. This was interesting because I had no idea who Brian Carey or his colleague Christopher Carmichael actually were. Mr. Carey admitted on the phone a few minutes later that he wasn't even sure which case he had filed in and that he was just following orders that someone had relayed to him. He had filed in the correct case, but for the wrong party. He quickly explained that he did not represent me after all and would be refiling his paperwork, which was filed in error. In fact, Kerry and Carmichael represented someone else. They represented the president of Nigeria, Bola Tinubu, who had decided to intervene in the case. To learn what happened next, check out part two, or to view any of the files mentioned in this video, go to plainsight.org.